<laughs> and now, I would like to introduce uh, a great friend of Drupal, uh, Josh Koenig. He's the co-founder and head of product at Pantheon. Thanks, Josh. Thank you, Holly. Um, good morning, DrupalCon! Uh, it's been 10 years since I attended my first community event, which was the Open Source CMS Summit in Vancouver, British Columbia in 2006, a moment that changed my life. And hopefully, you know, some of you who are coming to your first Drupal event, you'll have a similarly magical experience. I really want that for all of you. Um, it's also my birthday today, and so it's a really treat to be up here. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, like many of you, I believe that the web is the Earth's most powerful communication medium and one of the best things we have going as a species. Uh, it's a reason why I'm proud to have this slogan on my chest, not my company logo, but the slogan that says, I make the internet. I believe in that. Um, and more specifically, I believe in something that we're calling the open web. This is the internet that is built uh, on a philosophy of small pieces loosely joined that follows these original intents of the protocols to route the packets in the most efficient way possible and let people connect without, discrimina d without discrimination or barriers. Um, I think that Drupal has a destiny with regards to the open web, with helping organizations, businesses, and individuals express themselves and achieve their goals. There is nothing more important if you have a mission in the world Maybe there are a few things more important. There are a few things more important if you have a mission in the world than having a great website and being able to organize the entire planet to support your end. Um, and we make that possible for so many people. We build that open web. And today, unfortunately, the perhaps more, more than any time earlier in our history, the open web faces challenges. Um, we have stiff competition from proprietary vendors, from closed platforms, from walled garden providers. Um, and I think also we are contemplating the scale of the challenge before us. To truly build a worldwide operating system for humanity is a daunting task. And a lot of people struggle to choose the open web. They struggle because it's too complicated. There are too many um, unmarked decisions to be made. They worry about security. They worry about scalability. All these are reasons why people, you know, even if they aspire to the things that we see, they might say, ah, it's too hard. I can't do it. Or, ah, it's too risky. Or, I couldn't convince my boss. And so for the past five years uh, in, in building Pantheon, we have set out to try to eliminate those problems, to remove those barriers to entry for people to choose the open web, to make it fast to build, launch, and run websites using Drupal. Um, and this is not just because we think it's a big need for the community, it's because we think it's a big need for the world. Um, and we do this with joy in our hearts. Um, and so uh, it's a real pleasure to be here again at DrupalCon, to be in front of all of you for a few moments. Um, if you want to read more about my thoughts on the open web and Drupal 8, I just published a blog post I've been kind of working on for a month, so check that out. Um, and with that, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce the leader of the Drupal project, a man who is taller than me and a fearless champion for the open web, Mr. Dries Beitart. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Happy birthday. <laughs> All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, that pre note this morning was really, really good. I went from like tears in my eyes to goosebumps to like huge smile. Um, so, very, very excited to be here. Um, I didn't sleep well last night. And it wasn't because I you know, was partying too late or too long, but it's like, wow, I have a lot of slides. I have a lot of material that I want to share with you. And so I better get going. Let's see if it works. All right, so here are some of the topics I'd like to talk about today. Drupal 8, I want to give you a quick perspective on the market. I did a big survey, which I'm sure you saw, and many of you answered, and I want to talk about the results. And from that, I want to propose some initiatives on what to focus on uh, next. So first, let's start with Drupal 8. And the big news here is that, you know, we actually released Drupal 8. Well, <laughs> we finally did it after four and a half years of hard work. And what's even more amazing is that over 3,300 people contributed to Drupal 8. 
So we tripled the amount of contributors to Drupal 8. So <laughs> thank you to all of those that contributed. And when we released it, we celebrated it. We celebrated it with 240 parties all around the world, which is kind of amazing to think about, that people would all come together on one night to celebrate uh, Drupal. And Twitter was literally overflowing with photos. And it was so awesome to see all of the passion of people around the world and the diversity, and not just the diversity of the cakes, but also of all of the people. Um, it also happened to be my birthday. Um, and you know, it wasn't my idea, just to be very clear, it wasn't my idea to re release Drupal 8 on my birthday. I have to thank the, uh, the core committers for that. But um, it's, it's one hell of a way to celebrate your birthday, that's for sure. And so we released Drupal 8, and it ships with all of these great features. Um, I'm not going to talk about them all, but we really achieved many of our goals that we set out. We wanted to make Drupal 8 mobile first. We wanted to focus on making it easier for people to integrate with Drupal 8. We wanted to attract more developers. And so we switched to Symfony and object-oriented programming. And so in many ways, you know, Drupal 8 will be a great release. And not just because of the features, but also because we innovated around our community, our people, and our processes. Right? We made a lot of changes in the, in the last four and a half years. But then we also released Drupal 8.1. Just like we said we would. How amazing is that? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so a big thank you to all of the core committers um, and the release managers for you know, actually making Drupal 8.1 ship on time. It's really refreshing um, that we can do that. Um, and even better, you know, we shipped Drupal 8.1 with various new features as well as backwards compatibility. And so this is really a big deal for us, because compared to Drupal 7, Drupal 8 has a new innovation model that allows us to integrate, you know, add new innovations um, rapidly. And we'll, we'll make a new release available every six months. So this is great for all of you, because if you want to contribute, if you want to get things into Drupal core, you no longer have to wait you know, four and a half years, or up to four and a half years, for that code to be you know, become available. So hopefully, we'll see the adoption, uh, or we'll see the, uh, the number of contributors grow even more. And I showed this slide in Barcelona, DrupalCon Barcelona. I said, I believe there will be a huge spike in adoption once Drupal 8 is released. And I still truly believe that. We've added capabilities to Drupal 8 which weren't possible before. Things like the caching of authenticated users, things like BigPipe, architectural changes that enable these new big advances in technology. In addition to that, many, many things have become much, much easier. You know, managing translations or multilingual websites, authoring experience, much, much better. Extending parts of Drupal. You can do that now in ways that you couldn't do it in Drupal 7. And that will make a very big impact on how people use and extend Drupal. Block management, getting data in and out of Drupal. There's so much to like in Drupal 8 that I truly believe um, it creates a lot of opportunity for us. But we're kind of in this funny period, right? We're in this period where, um, you know, roughly there, where Drupal 7 adoption is kind of going down, yet Drupal 8 adoption is going up. And it creates a little bit of nervousness with some of you. But I've seen this many, many times. I've seen this, you know, I've been doing releases of Drupal for, you know, 15 years, actually. <laughs> and so this happens every major release of Drupal. We, we're in this funny period. Um, but if you actually dig in and you look at some of the numbers, you know, the data actually suggests that we are on track. That Drupal 8 is being adopted much faster than Drupal 7. Um, there's also a lot of anecdotal evidence. When I travel and I talk to people, I talk to organizations looking into Drupal 8, I see a lot of excitement. You know, people are really excited about the new capabilities. There's a couple of things we need to do, though. Um, for Drupal 8 to really take off, we need to port more modules. People need to learn Drupal, and we have to finish our migration tools. And if we do that, I really truly believe Drupal 8 will take off. And my guess is that by the end of this year, 
Drupal 8 will serve in, in, you know, serve in escape velocity, I guess, if you want to use the metaphor on the screen. That it will become the de facto standard. And so the way I think about Drupal 8, um, you know, is that it's kind of like a winner in progress, right? It's going to take a little bit of time for the ecosystem to adopt it. Um, but the new architecture and the features, as well as the frequent releases, all of these things make me feel really, really optimistic and bullish about Drupal 8. So that's where we are with Drupal 8. And I'm sure a lot of you are asking, so what's next for Drupal? How can I contribute? What are we going to work on next? And how will we keep Drupal relevant? And so that's what I, what I want to talk about next. And so before I do um, talk about the survey, I wanted to give you a quick perspective on sort of the market. And I think it's important to understand where we came from and where we are today in order to talk about the future, right? And so the way I wanted to present this to you is based on two dimensions. One is richness, which has to do about, with capabilities, features. The other dimension is called reach. And it's, it's about how many people use Drupal. And it's not necessarily installations of Drupal. It's also, you, you know, have, one installation can have more users than others. So it's kind of this magical reach number, I guess. <clears throat> and so we can plot it out in two dimensions. And ideally, where you want to be is in the top right corner, right? And the iPhone is a great example of that, which has maximum reach and maximum richness. It's one of the most powerful devices, right? And yet, it's also one of the most easy to use devices. And Apple did an incredible job combining these two things, because to most people, these, these feel at odds, right? It's hard to have a complex, powerful product, and at the same time, have it very, very easy to use. And then on the other side of the graph is this inflatable beard of bees has exactly zero or one use case, and not a lot of you know, richness to it, nor reach. And so over the years, Drupal has moved up into this graph um, to the top right. And, and we've done that because we've reinvented ourselves many, many times over. It's one of the great things about what we do, is that we're not afraid to make changes. We're not afraid to break our APIs, and we reinvent each other, uh, ourselves. And that has allowed us to leapfrog many of our competitors. And in fact, many of our competitors have died. You know, when I started Drupal, we would be talking about PHP Nuke, Vignette, I mean, all of these companies which have stopped to exist. And we still exist because we, we kept reinventing ourselves. And so if you kind of summarize 10 years of CMS history and oversimplify it and fast forward, you get something like this, in my opinion. And so what you see on this slide is a couple of different things. You can roughly group them in buckets. There is the, um, there is the software as a service website builders, like Squarespace and WordPress.com. And the, they've gotten a lot of reach. And they've gotten a lot of reach because they're easy to use and often beautiful. But they don't have the richness of Drupal. They don't have the architecture and the APIs of Drupal. And because they're software as a service, the technology uh, makes it inherently hard to, to keep, make these platforms truly extensible. And then there is the enterprise marketing suites. And they were forced by open source technologies like Drupal to diversify and to add capabilities to their stack. And so they invested in you know, analytics and commerce and personalization and a lot of like, big chunks of technology that they added to their platforms. So they got a lot of richness, but they don't have a lot of reach. So then there is newer players like headless CMSs. They focus on content modeling and web services and SDKs. Um, and so they're kind of emerging. And then there's always the frameworks. Uh, frameworks, as I've talked about in the past, are really good for building bespoke solutions. Um, and they've become easier to use uh, over the years. So they've kind of moved up, but they'll always be for bespoke solutions. And so really, you know, Drupal is kind of in an amazing place. It's, it's a great place to be in. And, you know, just look at some of the logos of organizations that recently adopted Drupal. Verda is one of the largest publishers in Europe. 
Um, they have 10,000 employees. They're moving most of their magazine websites to Drupal. Very exciting. Tesla is a big user of Drupal, not only their website, but also their mobile app is powered by Drupal. And rumor has it that their dashboard, the in-car dashboard, is also partially powered by Drupal. So it's a great example of a very innovative company innovating with Drupal. Pfizer, hundreds of Drupal sites, um, small and large. And they're really pushing the technology. They're really helping us to improve Drupal. Cisco, another amazing story, I think, for Drupal, which they build a support portal uh, in Drupal that allows their customers to do self-service through a website. And they saved over $400 million using their one Drupal site. Kind of an impressive story. And Nike is um, adopting more and more Drupal. And Nike is one of the largest sort of experience brands. You know, people love Nike for the experience. And for them to adopt Drupal uh, is also very, very compelling. And so I can go on and on and give more, more examples, but pretty exciting things are happening uh, in, my, in my view. All right, so this is just one way to look at this. Another and probably better way to look at this is roughly this. And what we can learn from these systems, these others, we can learn from the enterprise marketing suites about how to build customer experiences. We can learn from the software as a service website builders about the editorial experience. And this is both the authoring experience as a site builder experience. So think of this as the, the experience for non-coders. And then last but not least, we can learn from these other tools about the developer experience, right? And so if we want to get better, we need to learn from those. I'm going to put that on hold for a second and jump to the survey, and then I'll come back to this. Um, so after every major release of Drupal, I do this survey and I invite everybody in the community to answer uh, the survey. And um, you know, over 2,900 people answered the survey which is kind of a great number. We had uh, all sorts of uh, people answer the survey, authors, developers, themers, project managers, um, you know, individuals, small companies, large companies, absolute beginners, people exploring Drupal to you know, experts, people that have worked with Drupal for you know, over 10 years, let's say. And so I feel like that, you know, there's a lot of credible data there. And so we asked them questions, all sorts of questions, and I'm not going to go over all of the questions in this keynote, but I will share the results um, on my blog and on Drupal.org, so you can all look into the data yourself. But we asked them questions like this. You know, who should we focus on? Technical people or non-technical people? What should we improve for different personas? What should we improve for content authors? What should we improve for site builders and developers and themers? Um, and I'll show you the results uh, right now. So the first question I'll show you is, who should we favor when making product decisions? And what's exciting to me is that it kind of matches what I've been preaching for a long time, which is, uh, if you look at the results, people think that 75% of our effort, roughly, should be for non-coders. And that 25%, roughly, should be for you know, technical people back-end developers and front-end developers. And so I personally think that's pretty encouraging and exciting. Um, and then we go into the questions for each of the personas. So we asked, you know, what should we improve for content authors, as an example? And the way I visualized it on the screen uh, is the green bar is what content authors thought we should focus on for them. Right? And the yellow bar is what everybody thought we should focus on for content authors. So in the yellow bar, there may be developers saying, you know, for content authors, we need to focus on this. So what's interesting is um, that, you know, the results are roughly the same, right? So I think we do a good job sort of representing the other personas. Uh, also didn't show all of the results, by the way. And when I share the data, there will be much more detail. So I'm only showing the top seven results of answers to this question, so there's going to be more. Um, we asked the same thing for site builders. They want migration tools and block and layout management and data modeling, these kinds of things. And for developers, 
We ask the same question. I'll let you read it. Um, Object-oriented API, improved REST API, uh, things like that. And last but not least, we ask that for themers as well. I don't think there's huge surprises in this, is there? I think it's pretty consistent, I would say, with, you know, when I talk to people, what they say we should focus on. Um, all right, so this is some of the data, and I'll come back to that in a second. And so what I would like to do is use that data, um, you know, to make some, some decisions on what to focus on on Drupal, uh, you know, beyond Drupal 8.1. And so just like with Drupal 7, we had these initiatives, right? And so I think we should have initiatives again in Drupal 8. And the way we, you know, can handle these initiatives is we're going to look at the survey data, right? We have almost 3,000 people, you know, in the community tell us what we should do, so we should listen to them. But I don't think that's enough. I think we should also incorporate our vision. And for me, the vision has always been, you know, for Drupal to, build, to be the leading platform to assemble the world's best digital experiences. And, you know, I write digital experiences because, and I'll talk about this more, in, you know, in this presentation, it's no longer enough to just build websites, right? It, you know, it's about, like Tesla, powering the, you know, in-car display, or mobile apps, or kiosks, all of these things are experiences that move beyond the web. And the one thing that's really important to me, and also something that I've been talking about for years, all the way back to DrupalCon Sunnyvale, is this idea of assembly. And it goes pretty deep, personally. You know, it's really a big part of my purpose, which is about enabling non-technical people to do pretty compelling things on the web. Um, and, I, and I may have told this story in the past, but um, you know, many years ago, I had a brunch with my family and at their brunch, my mom told me she had breast cancer. And so the, the person I am is I would go home and I would start researching. I would spend hours re researching breast cancer. And so I stumbled upon this website. And it was a website built by women with breast cancer, for women with breast cancer. And it was built in Drupal. And I could instantly see it because it was using the, you know, ugly out-of-the-box Drupal team. <laughs> Forgot what the name was. Um, but, but that moment was really, you know, game-changing. I mean, it's great that the Nikes and the Pfizer's and, you know, all of these large companies use Drupal, and we should really celebrate that. But in addition to that, the notion that we can enable non-technical people, you know, to, to build these things and to share and connect with each other, I think is really, really important. And so... You know, that is the idea of Assemble. Thank you. And that's also why I was excited to see that, you know, people want us to spend 75% of our efforts, you know, on that audience. Um, all right, so we're going to look at the vision. Obviously, we need to take into account the market, which is why I gave you that update on the market. And then last but not least, you know, we need to talk about this, right? We need all of you to chime in and let me know, let us know what we should focus on. Um, you know, collaboration has always been the essence of Drupal, and so the leadership team, or however you want to call it, needs to be involved with these things as well. And so today what I want to do is I'm going to propose initiatives. Um, and an initiative, I try to come up with a little definition because I think it's helpful as we think about other initiatives or if you propose initiatives, what they should look like. But a good initiative, in my mind, results in a breakthrough for Drupal. Right? It also is clearly linked to the survey, the data, the vision, these kinds of things. But not anything should be an initiative. It should, have, it should require, actually, dedicated resources and focus and also involve collaboration from many different people. Um, you know, across the project. So if you have an idea, and it only takes one or two of you to go do it, you should go do it. It shouldn't be an initiative. Where it should be an initiative, it, if it's impactful, strategic, and it requires, you know, some of our best minds to come together and focus on this problem. And so 
These initiatives will go into kind of a bucket, proposed initiatives. And then we need to make sure, and this is something that we've learned from Drupal 7, that for each of these initiatives, we need a detailed plan, goals, a strong team behind it. And when all of these things are checked, and we all think it's a good initiative, it can progress to the planned initiative buckets. And then, excuse me, whenever we're ready to start working on it, it can become an active initiative because I don't think we can work on all of the initiatives at the same time, necessarily. Very important is I'm gonna propose some initiatives, but it's not the, you know, the final list. Uh, and in the past, we had great success in Drupal 7, uh, sorry, Drupal 8, with initiatives pr pr you know, that sort of came out of nowhere. You know, things like Twig or BigPipe, uh, big important things which weren't part of the traditional initiative process, and we absolutely need to keep that in place as well. But if you go through this process of planning and you know, activating initiatives, um, the benefit is that it avoids some bike shedding. You know, often we end up building something, and we spend months working on it, and then people chime in and they say, why are we even doing this? <laughs> right? Or, and so the idea is we go through a little bit more planning where we agree, do we want this? What should be the architecture? Let's agree on user the user interface of this thing. And when the right people sign off, depending on what it is, then hopefully we don't have to like sort of bike shed all of the, the details uh, once we're actually working on an initiative. And so I think it's a next step in the maturity model of how we develop software uh, together. And so we're currently in the process of defining this process. So this is kind of a high level overview of how it works. All right, so, so now let's look at all of the data, let's look at the market stuff, let's look at the process and propose some initiatives. And so the first thing I wanna come back to is, is this slide. You know, 75% of our efforts should be on the editorial experience. And again, that's both content authors and site builders. And site builders, in this case, is the non-coders, right? It's the people that configure or assemble a site. All right, so then let's go to the content authors first. If you look at these results, the top two items are about media. The first one is about integration with WYSIWYG, and the second one is more on the back end, which is kind of the image library. And so the first initiative I'd like to propose is a media initiative. And it's about giving authors and editors a very simple UI to do drag and drop. We created some mockups, but um, I should clarify, these are just some inspirational designs. It doesn't have to be like this necessarily, but I do wanna give everybody in the audience, not everybody is familiar with what's you know, available today. And so um, I wanted to give a sense of what this could look like. Obviously, it will need to be discussed and reviewed and all of these things. But before I show it to you, what's important to me is that we measure success not by certain modules getting into core, but we measure su success when these things are very, very easy to use, right? Because remember, we're doing this for the non-technical people, so it has to just work. And so, you know, it could be WYSIWYG integration, where if you want to replace an image, you just click the image, maybe a little slider comes out, you click the right image, and in it goes, right? Easy, easy experiences. And this is the, 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 um, the OI, stands for outside in. I won't explain it right now, but I've been writing about this. Um, so check it out on my blog. It, it means that the experiences are outside in that. You don't have to kind of do, you know, go to a back end. You can just manipulate things right on the page. And I think it's gonna be key um, to improving our user experience. And the back end could look like this, where there's a library, um, of all sorts of assets, images. You can easily upload them, and we support things like multi-upload and stuff like that. So hopefully this week we can spend some time in trying to figure out what exactly we should build. And so media is one of the initiatives. It can go in the proposed initiative bucket. The second group of things, if you think about all of these things, they all have to do with workflow. People really want better workflow tools in Drupal. And so the second initiative 
that I'd like to propose is, I call it the workflow initiative. So it's, a, it's to give authors and editors easy to use tools to you know, collaborate on writing content, to preview content, all of these things. And there's a lot of different nuances and details there, but one use case that could be really interesting to do is, you know, it's called the election uh, scenario, or you know, a lot of media companies have this. For example, when there's a, a Super Bowl, organizations often have to prepare two versions of the site. You know, one version if the Saint win, another version if the Colts win. And they need to be able to um, you know, build out multiple pages. It's not just one page. It's like a whole section on the website, including menus and all of these things. And they need to be able to preview them, like fast forward in time to see how it would look like on the day of the Super Bowl, let's say. And then very easily, they need to be able to publish this you know, by clicking a button. So some examples of the things that people are asking for. And so in this case, there's actually a team in place. We have a great team. There's a large company that's really putting their weight behind this. Yeah. <laughs> There's a plan that was just posted. There's a high level overview of my blog and details um, in that issue. And if you want to join this team, you're obviously welcome to join the team as well. But this is an initiative where we did a lot of planning uh, already. And so, um, we can put it in the proposed initiative bucket and really um, sort of advance it to the planned initiatives already. All right, next, side builders. Not surprisingly, people really want migration tools. People want to use Drupal 8, and they're waiting for these migration tools um, you know, to be able to migrate them. Uh, very, very important. Needless to say, in fact, this is kind of an active initiative already. We have a migrate initiative. We just added the migrate UI to core. And so please come and help with this and attend the sprint on Friday. The next one is blocks and layouts, something that people have been asked for for many, many years. And so blocks and layout is what I would like to be an initiative as well. And it's about giving site builders tools to build pages, to change layouts, to add blocks, all of these things. Here's how it could look like. Um, instead of having to learn about regions on the backend UI and having to memorize all of the regions and then placing a block without seeing where it actually goes, we should also make it outside in. You should be able to select on the page where you want the block to go. Right? You should have that option. Um, and then when you select it, you should be able to very easily select the block and you know, in it goes. No need to scroll on a long page and these kinds of things. And then if you want, you should be able to set various kinds of visibility conditions. And this is an oversimplification, uh, but it's some, some of the things we're working on right now and trying to figure out how we best do these things. Same thing with layouts. You know, what if you could just flick on a little icon, a slider comes out, you can choose between different layouts, you can make changes very easy. I think it would be pretty cool, and so therefore, it's a proposed initiative. Next is the data modeling tools. Um, also really, really important, and again, this is, a lot of this is about making it easier to use, because Drupal is already really great at these things, and Drupal 8 is even better than Drupal 7 at these things, but how do you make it more easy to use? Um, and so I'll give you an example as well. Let's say we have a website for people that are foodies and that like to put on events. And at these foodie events, they like to share recipes with each other, right? So let's say you want to build that kind of site. Well, today it re requires a lot of clicking. Um, but what if it looked something like this, um, where you could start from primitive types? Let's say you want to build a meetup site. Well, you could start from events. You click the event. Um, you can rename it to meetups, um, you know, things like that. You can select if you want to pull through related entity types, like venue or attendee or speaker. And if you do, um, if you do, you get this, right? So very easy to model some, some, uh, some content types. Now, because it's a foodies meetup where we share recipes, you want to add recipes to each of these meetups. 
And so, again, there may be a recipe uh, entity available, or maybe you create your own, but you just, you know, click recipe, it goes here. You can say it's multi-value, meaning there can be multiple recipes with each event, and you add it. You can see it, how it's very clean and provides a good overview of, of sort of the content model in Drupal. Now imagine you want to change some of the fields in, you know, one of these things. You can just click on them, change the default, save them, and done. And so, again, let's use this as a starting point to explore some ideas on how we can make field UI and views and, and all of these things easier and more tightly integrated. With views in core, I think it's actually very exciting because we can start to look for tighter integration um, as well. All right, developers. Number one thing is, you know, making everything OO. And so I think this is really important as well, but I don't think it's an initiative. It doesn't match the requirements in a, of an initiative. So it doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. We should absolutely do it, but we should just do it as we work on core, you know, submit patches, all of these things. Um, and so the next item is the REST API. And if we take some other things into this, I believe we can create an initiative which, which is called API First. Um, and the API First initiative is not just about, you know, making the Drupal 8 REST API better. I think it involves a couple of different things. First of all, Drupal 8 now ships with web services, but there is also some other modules. There's a, several contributed modules that people can use, and it's a little bit confusing. So one of the things I believe we should do is to try and consolidate where it makes sense to consolidate. So there's one great unified REST API in core. But that's not enough. Uh, if you go back to the, uh, the other slide where I talked about headless CMSs, you see that these have SDKs, things like that, and GraphQL. And so I think the way we get truly, truly great at this is if we also embrace these kinds of things. Uh, and I think it would be great not just for front-end development, but also for people that want to integrate with Drupal on the back end, which is becoming increasingly important. And, you know, some of the things this will allow us to do, it's actually pretty powerful. The MTA, which is the New York, um, you know, metro system, um, they're actually starting to build digital kiosks all around New York, and they'll be powered by Drupal. Pretty cool, no? So it's an example of a sort of a digital experience that's not a web experience. I mentioned Tesla. Lufthansa is actively working on rebuilding the in-flight entertainment system in Drupal 8. So now Drupal will be in planes. How cool is that? And so these are all things which are possible or made possible by, you know, web services. And so I think we should make that better. So that's API first. And then for themers, they really want the component-based theme system. Uh, well, um, I think it's really important. I'm not the expert on it. I'm not a themer. <laughs> um, but the goal is, you know, to make it much easier, um, you know, to build and reuse different themes. And it's inspired by, um, you know, atomic design. And the idea is that you start with fields at a low level, like a text field, that you combine atoms into bigger pieces, like a search box, and that, again, you can combine into something bigger, like a, a property finder or something. Now, these things become very easy to use. So it's, the way I think about it, it's, it's kind of a combination between a style guide and a pattern library, and it cleans up a lot of the, you know, hairy arrays in the theme system. Um, and so if you want to know more about this, you know, go talk to uh, John Albin, as well as Wim Leer. They're both uh, champions of this. And so let's add that as well. All right. So if we look at all of these things together, you know, we roughly get this. And so if we focus on these, um, what is it, seven initiatives, I think we would do a really great job listening to our users and making Drupal better. But is it enough? <laughs> I'm not sure it is because we haven't touched upon the customer experience part yet. I know. What about them, right? <laughs> and so I'm glad you asked. Um, so let's talk a little bit about that. 
So the important thing here is um, there's several key trends. First of all, customer experiences are becoming cross-channel. If you buy an Apple Watch, as an example, you go to the Apple website and you get an e-commerce experience on the web, but then very quickly you get an email. And in my case, I also get a text message. I get a text message when the watch left the warehouse. Right? And that's a customer experience. It's the whole thing across different channels and the fact that it all connects together uh, in one experience. Here's another example. Nike, uh, it's, a, it's an Internet of Things example. Nike is working on these smart shoes. And so these are sh shoes with a chip, if you will. And um, not only will it be able to track your steps, but also if you have walked X amount of miles, they could basically say, hey, and we mocked this up, this is not real, but this is a uh, notification, and it says something like, you know, you ran 350 miles with these shoes, and you should really replace them if you don't want to get an injury, right? The sole is worn out. And you swipe left, and you can click buy right there. Right, so this is a great customer experience. And what's interesting about it, it doesn't involve a website, right? There is no website involved. And so for us, we have to think about this. Um, what's also interesting about this is the disruption that this will cause in the market. Because Nike has never been able to build this one-on-one -on -one relationship with their customer. So now imagine thousands of companies, tens of thousands of companies, being able to build a one-on-one -on -one relationship with their customers. They, they can buy, uh, bypass Amazon.com. They can bypass retailers. So the impact on the supply chains and the market will be pretty, um, you know, potentially intense. Um, increasingly more, there is also conversational UIs. There's a lot of writing and blogging and speaking about these things. You know, examples include, you know, Amazon Echo, uh, where you can have an experience without even using a keyboard. Uh, there's also chatbots and all of these things coming online. And I personally believe that uh, conversational interfaces are, you know, here to stay. Um, it's not often that big technology platforms come along that change the way we work. I feel like the last time this happened was mobile. Like, you know, let's say 10 years ago or five years ago. And mobile caused all sorts of things to change. It caused people to rethink how they do content strategy. But then it trickled down to the technology as well. People came up with HTML, HTML5, um, you know, native apps and all sorts of programming languages there. Um, all sorts of things came out of mobile. And I feel the same will happen with conversational UIs. And so we have to pay attention. And then there's uh, personalization. I've talked about this in previous keynotes. I don't really need to rehash it. but. The simple idea is to use rich customer data and rich content, lots of content, more specialized content, more variants of the same content, and to build algorithms that match the two, to try and figure out how we provide the best next experience to the user. And if you're successful at that, you can provide more relevant contextual experiences. And it can provide both customer value as well as business value. Right, so this is happening as well. And so here you see an overview of some of these trends. Um, and so what we did is we actually built a Drupal 8 website. And it's, um, this is the website. And it's for a, a grocery store called Gourmet Market. Right? And Gu Gourmet Market is a Drupal 8 user, but they also want their customers not only to be able to use the website, but also to use Echo, as well as push notifications, and some of these things that I just talked about. And so we built this in Drupal 8, and we recorded a demo of it. And so I'm going to show you the demo. Uh, in the demo, I played a customer. All right? Let's see if it works. Alexa, ask Gourmet Market what fruits are on sale today. We have hundreds of stores. What's your zip code so I can locate the nearest one? 19042. Here's the fruit that's on sale at Gourmet Market on 72nd and Broadway. Apples are currently 50 cents a pound. Bananas are on sale for 20 cents each. 
Anything else I can help with? Um, there's an awesome sauce and sale. Awesome sauce isn't on sale right now, but I'll notify you when it is. What is your phone number? 978-595-4242. Um, Great. I'll let you know when awesome sauce is on sale. There you have it. <laughs> I just bought some awesome sauce from a Drupal site without actually using the page. Um, and this wasn't my real phone number, by the way. <laughs> I'm sure some of you are already calling. Um, and so there's a module. You can go check it out. There's the Alexa module uh, for Drupal 8. So you can play around with it yourself. Um, so what's interesting about this, um, is, I mean, it's possible today, obviously, um, where, you know, you change something in Drupal, you get a notification, and people can buy it um, with a swipe. But we have to think bigger. We have to think beyond this. Um, and so if you think about this example, you may not always want to send a notification. What if the user is asleep? Maybe you want to schedule that notification. Or what if the user doesn't like to so get text messages and you want to email, maybe, right? And so that's what I mean with orchestration. Like, how do you orchestrate the best experience or the best next experience? You don't want to send too much information. You also don't want to send too little information. You need to pick the channel you want to send it on, these kinds of things. And so we have to start thinking about building user interfaces you know, something like this, right? If the user is in the car, well, maybe we should send an audio message through the connected car instead of a text message. Not a good idea to send text messages when people are driving. Uh, you know, stuff like that. And so, very rough mock-up of, of what this could look like. Um, you know, there's a successful order, you'll want to send a receipt, and you can edit the receipt. So the two pieces to this, which I highlighted, is one, we need to think about editing content beyond pages. Like, how do you edit a notification? How do you craft an email? How do you create an audio message? Right? An audio message may actually require us to think beyond storing just text, but, you know, actual audio. Um, and the second piece is the orchestration. And initially, a lot of this could be rule-based, you know, something like rules, really, um, where you can, you know, create all of these different rules and do fairly complex orchestration. But over time, this is where machine learning will be also very important. Because you may learn that, you know, Michael likes text messages, but Julie prefers email, right? So there's a lot of complexity in, in making that orchestration right. And so what I'd like to propose is that we also start thinking about cross-channel and orchestration. And if you combine all of these things, it could roughly look like this. Uh, some of these things actually benefit different buckets, like API first and data modeling are very, very important for um, the customer experience stuff. Um, and so to wrap it up, um, you know, I've, I truly believe Drupal 8 will be great. We're on track. Um, we're doing better than Drupal 7. We'll have more frequent releases with many more features to come. If we focus on the things that I proposed, I really truly believe we can reinvent ourselves, leapfrog the others. Like nobody else is thinking about this or doing this. And I believe this is how we could, you know, win in the long run. Um, I proposed the strategy and some direction to get there. Um, and needless to say, I'll continue to look for your leadership, your input, your ideas. As I said, it, it's all a collaborative effort. So. 
looking forward to starting conversations this week, talking to you know, all of you, brainstorming about how to move this forward. I really believe that you know, we're playing the long game here. We're really building towards something that I, I think could be really compelling. It's going to take a little bit of time, which is OK, um, but we'll win. And so with that, I'd like to say thank you and uh, ask some questions. This is also, by the way, some of the survey results. It's people, we asked the question, describe Drupal in one word. And so some of the words are <laughs> on the screen. Hey. Thank you. You want to sit down? Sure, yeah. <laughs> I guess I get to sit with the king here all right. and the king here. Um, <laughs> All right, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Lockhart. I'm doing the Q&A with Dries here. Um, so we're fielding some questions from uh, the audience via the Dries Note hashtag, and I have a few to start off. So um, I think the most pressing question is, uh, where can we get a beard of bees? Where do we buy that? <laughs> I don't know, actually. Yeah. Amazon.com. <laughs> Perfect, OK. Um, actually, if you feel under your chair, <laughs> we all get you a, a beard. <laughs> Check under the king there. Uh, so Drupal is a very developer-focused ecosystem, um, and a large majority of what you discussed in your Dries note was focused on the front end, the, uh, the content authors, and, and that experience. How can we empower developers to um, focus on that experience and to make that a stronger uh, experience for those content uh, yeah. administrators and so on? I actually think the, um, it's a good question. I actually think the ultimate goal, at least in my mind, is to have a very tightly coupled um, administration experience. Like, you know, outside in is an example of that where uh, we're bringing configuration into the page, right? So it's very coupled with the front end. But the way we want to build that is actually in a decoupled way. And so it's you know, maybe a little counterintuitive, but how do we create a very tight, tightly coupled user experience, but underlying architecture that is decoupled? And I think developers can help with you know, further decoupling of Drupal, uh, as an example. Like one great example of outside in today is uh, our in place editing in Drupal 8, where people can just double click or you know, click to edit content. But the way it's architected right now, it's using sort of special you know, Drupalisms um, in terms of an API. But what if we could actually build a REST API that allows us to do that kind of editing? And how can we make uh, in-place editing actually use our REST API, right? So it's an example of a coupled uh, experience, but, you know, architected in a decoupled way. And I think that's a pretty important way that developers can help. Okay. Um, and just to piggyback on that question a little bit, um, there were, were several tweets that uh, mentioned the uh, technical ecosystem of Drupal.org and comparisons to GitHub and, and those sorts of uh, ecosystems and how that process could be improved in Drupal.org. There's obviously some uh, contentment with how the GitHub experience works and um, how could you see the Drupal.org uh, experience improve for developers? Um, yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a great question. And I think um, we, we absolutely have to make it better. Um, the how we're going to do that, I think, is something, I mean, I don't have clear answers to this, but one option is GitHub. The other extreme is continuing to build it ourselves. There's options in between as well, like things like GitLab, which is basically you know, self-hosted GitHub. Um, and so I really think we should you know, talk about this and, and figure out how we want to get out of the business of building our own tools so we can focus more of our efforts into, you know, actually doing the things that are unique to Drupal, you know. Like, I don't feel like we should reinvent a lot of that tooling, personally. Um, at the same time, you know, there is a lot of trade-offs if you move, you know, from one system to another. Um, and I personally believe, sorry, that we would win more than we lose if we were to move to GitHub. But that's just my, my personal opinion. And we've seen some examples, uh, for example, the uh, Path Auto contributor module, where development was done on that for Drupal 8, and then it was ported into uh, the Drupal.org ecosystem. Um, 
do you think that's maybe a halfway bridge in between moving to something else in the future, or? Yeah, I mean, I think people are just starting to move to GitHub, you know, and I mean, <laughs> it's nothing we can do about that. So, I, you know, I think different groups of people have picked their, their favorite way of working. Um, the only thing that's a little bit sad about that is that it kind of breaks down the credit system and, you know, being completely, you know, using different systems make it a little bit harder to track what's going on. Um, so, yeah. Uh, one topic that wasn't in your uh, uh, Dries note that I wanted to touch on was the subject of burnout in the community. Um, there are a lot of big numbers in the Drupal world now, 15 years old. Um, uh, many of us have been to many DrupalCons. This is my 10th, um, um, and so on. Um, uh, in, in Toronto, part of the Drupal group I'm involved with, we had our 10th anniversary Drupal camp. So there are a lot of big milestones happening. But that is also an indication that People have been working with Drupal a long time, and um, and you yourself, you're uh, working with Aquia, you're working with the community, you've got a family, you're a busy man. How do you deal with burnout, and um, what are your suggestions to uh, for people in the audience who have experienced that? Yeah, um, I mean, the topic of burnout is a very big topic, um, and I'm by no means the expert, but um, I can share a few thoughts about it. Um, I think. There's a couple of reasons why burnout can happen. One of them is when people do something over and over again, and it's very repetitive, not enjoyable, and they don't see kind of a better future, right? Um, I think when that happens, we need to figure out how we can make their lives better as a community. I think that's one thing. The second reason I believe burnout happens is because people are, you know, they're so committed. <laughs> To Drupal, and and often burnout is self in, you know self inflicted. It's you know people that feel that they need to work even harder or do even more, and so it's some of it is really up to the individuals themselves and to say, hey, I need I need to take a break. I need to step away from Drupal for a couple of weeks or a couple of months, and that's totally okay. And and we can help those people by telling them, you know, like maybe you should take a little break, and if you do take a little bit a little bit of a break, that's totally fine. You know what I mean? And so it's um, helping to create that culture, I think, is really important. And then to answer, I guess, uh, the last part of your question, for me, it helps to have variety. You know, like I'm, I'm very busy, but I do many different things. And I think that, that helps with, you know, with, with things like burnout. So, so if, you, if you translate that to, um, you know, to your lives, uh, maybe one way to deal with burnout is to try and, you know, contribute in different ways or to do different things or to, you know, go explore another project and come back with great ideas. Just try and build in some more variety, I guess, uh, would be my advice. So I, I would assume you're going to go out with your camera quite a bit during uh, DrupalCon when you get chances? Yes. <laughs> I brought my big camera. So. Fantastic. Um, so... Uh, Again, to piggyback on a question of, of burnout and working hard, um, multilingual is built into Drupal, uh, Drupal 8 core, and that opens up a um, um, you know a whole world, literally a whole world of uh, Drupal in uh, non-English speaking countries. Uh, India, for example, there was DrupalCon there, and that was quite successful. Uh, China, Japan. Um, do you have any uh, thoughts on on where we can go as a community with with um, Internationalization. Yeah, I mean, I think we can go everywhere. I really, truly believe that Drupal is a global project and continues to become more global. Um, and you know, you mentioned India, and it's actually, you know, we had DrupalCon India not too long ago, and it was for those that were there. I mean, it was so exciting. Like, I mean, it was just unbelievably exciting um, to see all of the people be so passionate, really, about Drupal. And it's also mind-blowing about what's happening. And, and some of that is, is a result of you know, us getting better at multilingual. And I'll give you one example. So the conference uh, was at um, sort of the, the main university. It's kind of the MIT of India, if you will. And uh, I had a chance to sit down with um, you know, one of the professors of the computer science department. And you know, they got a, a billion dollar grant I mean, a huge grant from the government. And their mission was to go build these little laptops, almost like 
uh, one laptop a child. But the lap I actually saw a laptop and used it, and it was actually better. You know, it actually had a real screen and that kind of stuff. And they're selling these laptops in India to students for like, I thought it was $200, or $100 to $200, so pretty cheap. Um, and so they sold two million of these laptops, right? And so it's very important um, that, that it is affordable because they're used by students all around India, you know, over two million people now. And um, on that laptop, they put an open source stack. So it runs on Linux, and on that Linux um, system, they put tutorials. Tutorials on how to become experts in open source technologies. Um, and it works completely offline because most students have no internet. Even some of the larger universities, uh, maybe only 100 stu students can, can be online at the same time. So even at a university, there's not universal internet access. And so when I met with the professor, he told me they're you know, actively working on putting you know, Drupal curriculum on these laptops. So they're making videos and tutorials and all of these things. And so, you know, think about that because, you know, it's two million people in India that will uh, get a chance to learn Drupal, self-study Drupal all around the country. And maybe the next three years, it, maybe they'll sell two million more. And so the idea of millions of people uh, having the opportunity to become Drupal experts and the impact that that can have on, on our community is just mind-blowing. And so that's only one thing that's happening in one country. So now think about what could happen, you know, if Drupal really takes off in, you know, China and, you know, these other countries. And so, yes, I think multilingual is key. And um, overcoming language barriers is also key. So I'm very excited about some of the work in Drupal 8 around multilingual and uh, the translation community, so it's very cool. Fantastic. Uh, I believe that's it for our time for questions. So we're going to um, hand it off to Jam. He will take the stage from here. We'll do a group photo, and uh, there we go. Thanks, Therese. All right. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Hey, because you didn't have enough of me yet, we're going to set up to do the group photo. And if you do this well and efficiently, you'll be to your coffees quicker. We're going to have a photographer setting up on stage on a ladder. And um, although I can't see everyone right now, I understand that basically the photo is going to take this sort of triangle shape. So people out on the edges need to come in towards the middle. We can fill up all the aisles standing. I guess everybody should be standing. Yes. Everybody should be standing, says Rachel. Come into the middle. Yeah. They just turned it up to excited everybody. Okay. Yeah, so we can just kind of go right up to here for now. Okay. And can right up to the stage? Yeah, you can go ahead and have a kind of Okay, we can also fill up this get this space right in front of the stage here. Just leave one hole for me to stand in so I can be in the photo. Anybody got anybody got any new clever gags that we can do? We did pointing, we did wave. We could try jumping, right? Yeah. Huh. 